Chapter 11 Actually, the trail wasn't that hard to pick up and follow, consisting as it did of trashed furniture, doors hacked down, and drooping sadly from their hinges. Bannister rails chopped into firewood, shredded curtains, disembowelled filing cabinets, and other subtle clues. It led from the closed file store along the corridor, through the laser printer room, which no longer contained a functional laser printer, up the stairs, over the landing, down the stairs to the strong room, apparently not as strong as all that, back up the stairs to the third floor, in and out of half a dozen offices, back down the other staircase, into the front office, sideways into the post room, and along the corridor, straight back to the closed file store from the other direction. Which suggests, Paul started to say... The closed file store no longer had a door in any meaningful sense, but there were just enough splinters still hanging onto the hinges to provide a screen of sorts. They paused and listened. Sure enough, from the other side of the doorway came bangs, crashes, thuds, the clash of steel, and what Paul took to be some very rude words indeed in Old Norse. I I I think they're in there, he whispered. Mr Tanner's mum nodded. Fine, she said, and then she asked... And one of them's our Ricky. So who's the other one then? No idea. Sorry. She looked at him and grinned. You want me to go first, don't you? If it's no bother. Her grin spread a couple of inches, like an oil slick. This would be a good time for me to name my price, she said. How about dinner at my place? Followed by, (laughs) shit, I was only kidding, come back here. She grabbed his shoulder and pulled him back. If they kill me, she said, the door stuffed down the front of my knickers. She leered at him. You just help yourself, all right. Come back safe, Paul replied, with feeling. Spoil sport. Mr Tanner's mum took a deep stance and shouldered aside the tattered fragments of the door and bundled through. Paul heard a crash, a chunky sort of sound, another noise which could conceivably have been two skulls colliding with great force, and Mr Tanner's mum yelling, What the hell? Then silence. Mr the carpenter? Paul swung round so fast that he almost lost his footing. Behind him stood Professor Van Spee. He looked pretty much the same as always. Long, thin, little, wispy white beard. Old, but best quality dark grey wool worsted suit. Watery pale blue eyes, apart from the custard pile and a paper plate that he held in his right hand. That was a new one on Paul, and he wasn't quite sure he liked it. Please take one step to your right, the Professor said. Thank you. Well, Paul thought, why not? It's not as if I'm particularly attached to this square foot of carpet. Naturally, he wasn't in the least bit scared of an old man with a custard pie of all things. Absolutely not. Ridiculous. No, he just fancied a very small spot of exercise. Change of perspective. Fresh carpet squares and pastures new. (laughs) He moved. Thank you, the professor repeated, and with his left hand he pointed at the door frame and the mangled remains of the door. There was no flash of brilliant blue light, shower of sparks, ripple effect, but the doorway sort of healed up rather quickly until there was nothing to show that it had ever been there. Just a minute, Paul said. There's people in there. The professor nodded. Correct, he said. Dietrich von Tota, Mr. Tanner's mother, and uh, he sighed, apparently with genuine regret. You, he added. It's very disappointing. I had hoped that this time matters could have been arranged rather more efficiently and with a minimum of suffering. Unfortunately not. Naturally, I accept all the blame myself. I should have done better. I... He hesitated, like someone bracing himself to pull a plaster off his arm. I am sorry, he said. That didn't sound good at all. What did you just do? Paul demanded. Can I get out? The professor shook his head. Sadly, no, he replied, not even by using my portable door, which for some reason Mr. Tanner's mother has seen fit to insert inside her underwear. It can bring you back from the land of the dead, as you know, but it will not work where they have gone, indeed, where the whole room has gone. Demolish that wall and you will find yourself out in the street. Most unfortunate. Paul stared at him for a moment. They're dead, then, he said. You killed them. In a sense, the professor frowned slightly. Mr. Carpenter, you have seen yourself what I can do, how I can shift the course of comets, calculate the effects of such alterations hundreds of years in the future. I can do most things. In fact, I can build worlds, he added in a mild, almost apologetic voice, such as the one we are presently occupying. It is certainly not beyond my capabilities to end two lives, either practically or in terms of having the determination to do such a serious thing. They no longer exist, and I have brought that about. 
I suppose she could interpret that as an act of killing. Uh, right, Paul said. Glad we got the semantics sorted out. Uh, why? Ah, the professor sighed. That Mr. Carpenter would be a very long story. You wish to hear it, but you are also very angry and rather afraid. You are speculating as to whether you can escape from me, or whether you would be able to overpower me, possibly do me bodily harm. Part of you believes that you ought to want to harm me, a duty to exact revenge, to punish me for what I have just done. Another part of you abhors the thought of violence, and as yet has not come to terms with the killing of Antonia de Gauchelin, even though that was done in self-defence and would be considered entirely justifiable in virtually all legal jurisdictions. You are also tired, confused, hungry and painfully thirsty, and have pulled a muscle in your neck. Fuck you, Paul said. Anger, the professor nodded slowly, like a wine buff acknowledging an adequate burgundy. An admiral piece of engineering in its way. Anger is both a lubricant and an undersetic. Evolution requires that we retain it in our genetic matrix because it makes it possible for us in moments of great stress and danger to override various restraint mechanisms. Fear, for example, and ethics, in order to do something necessary but unpleasant. Slowly and carefully, he put the cost of pie down on the floor. Anger at an injury to ourselves or one of our own makes it possible to retaliate, to avenge, thereby preventing or making less likely a repetition of the original injury. It is as useful as any other tool, but is in essence a very simplistic reaction. It is possible to control it, even in the most extreme circumstances, and I would urge you to do so in this case. It will not help, and it is likely to make things worse for you. However... The professor added, if you feel you absolutely must, you may proceed. Paul thought about it. Absolutely must he? Well, he thought, yes. He took a big step towards the professor until he was about two feet from his nose, then swung back his right fist and punched as hard as he could. He missed. At first he assumed that the professor had ducked, but now he came to think of it. He'd maintained eye contact all of the time, and the old bastard hadn't moved at all. He just... Miss, that was all. You may try again if you wish, the professor said, but the outcome will be the same. In case you feel belittled or humiliated by your failure to harm me, I should point out that thousands have tried it and no one has ever succeeded. It can't be done. Like hell, Paul snapped and lashed out with his leg. He felt something go in his knee and hobbled over to the wall for support. Ow, he complained. A very sight spring, the professor said. There should be no lasting impairment. Can we consider the experiments duly carried out? Paul nodded. Bastard, he said. So, are you going to kill me too? This time the professor frowned, as though what Paul had just said didn't make sense. But I already have, he said, inclining his head in the direction of the patch of wall where the door had once been. Further action would therefore be superfluous and a pointless waste of resources. However, he added sternly, I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to leave this place. Your presence is frankly disruptive. And as you must by now appreciate, matters are coming to a head. You do not know where to go, of course, and I must confess that I cannot help you to reach a decision. However, it is of little importance, or things considered, either to you or me. He paused and looked at Paul with a curious blend of annoyance and compassion. You do not understand, he said. Perhaps it would be a kindness to explain. After all, I have not done so before on the grounds of the parts of the story that concern you would cause you undue alarm, and the parts that do not are none of your concern. However, in spite of everything, I am and always have been primarily a scientist. Intellectual curiosity is my besetting sin, and I find it hard to deny it in others. If you wish to hear the whole story, Mr. Carpenter, I will tell it to you, and you must leave. Is that acceptable to you? Paul shook his head. No, he said, but tell me anyway. The professor smiled. You only wish to learn in the hope that the knowledge will better equip you to fight, he said. If you were not involved, you would prefer not to know. 
But nevertheless, I will tell you. Perhaps it will make me feel better if I tell you. On balance, I believe that is the true reason. No matter. He blinked and a deep, snow-looking armchair appeared out of nowhere. Rather to his surprise, Paul discovered that he was sitting in it. You are sitting comfortably, the professor said. I shall begin. In the beginning, said Professor Vansby, there was darkness and emptiness and confusion. The creator of all things brought light and order and understanding, and the universe began. He divided everything into four elements, earth, air, fire and water. He held them in place by the force of his will, arranged them in time so that one thing followed another, confined them in space so that each of them had form and structure and was separate from the rest. That is how it was meant to be, and it was a satisfactory arrangement. Unfortunately, I saw fit to interfere. With hindsight, I regret having done so. However, I had very little choice, as you would see. As I mentioned a moment ago, I am a scientist. All I ever wanted to do was to understand how things worked, what made the universe behave as it does, the properties of materials, the effect of processes, the nature of time. Accordingly, I studied long and hard, and eventually I learned everything. The answers to all the questions that I have just referred to, I knew and I understood, and there was nothing left to find out. I was therefore at something of a loss, when, as a young man, I had set myself to my task. I had assumed, perhaps foolishly, that it was impossible, that I must inevitably die before I could complete it. But, in the course of my researches, I discovered simple techniques for the unlimited extension of life, the arrest of entropy and decay. Death no longer applied to me, neither did sickness or disability. I had also assumed that my frail human intellect would not be able to grasp the vastness of the concepts I had set myself to address. In that too, I was wrong. In due course, therefore, I reached the point where I had accomplished the purpose of my existence, but in doing so, I had made it impossible for that existence to come to a natural end. I could only cease to exist if I took steps. Difficult, complicated steps involving lengthy and tedious procedures to destroy myself. Quite apart from an instinctive reluctance, I felt that to destroy such a complete and unique work of scholarship as I had become would be the most unpardonable act of vandalism. I could not do it, but I had no purpose. I had nothing to do. I was bored. It then occurred to me that since I had a complete and perfect knowledge of the universe as it existed, I might find a worthwhile occupation for my time in creating another universe, an artificial one if you wish to call it that. Compared to my original task, this would be a trivial matter, an amusement, a diversion. I couldn't hope to learn anything from it, since by its very nature it would contain nothing that I did not already know and understand. But you must appreciate that hitherto I had been passive, a mere consumer of pre-existing information. It would make a pleasant change, I felt, to be active, to create rather than to merely observe. And as I have said, I had nothing better to do with my time. Immediately I found that my choices were restricted by the nature of the materials available to me. There are, as I have taught you, only four elements from which the universe is made up. At once I took a fierce delight in the challenge. The contrariness of my nature rejoiced to find something that apparently I could not do, and I was grimly determined to do it for that very reason. I resolved to create, more accurately to synthesize, a completely new element, and in my arrogance I made up my mind that it should not only be new, but better than the original four. I would create my new element, and my entire self-made universe would be built from it alone. By virtue of that, it would be different, to a greater or lesser extent, from the natural universe. In those differences might lie new things to learn, new mysteries to explore. You might say that I was in the position of a detective who, having solved all the crimes in the world, must resort to committing new crimes of his own in order to have something to investigate. The analogy is, of course, imperfect, but I offer it for what it is worth. 
In order to create my element, therefore, I stole the great cow of heaven. You what? Paul interrupted. I beg your pardon. D did you just say, Paul elucidated, uh, the great cow of heaven? Correct. Her name is Autumnla, and from her milk, the creator of all things. Fuck a stoat sideways up a palm tree, Paul said. Uh, sorry, interrupted. Y you were saying. I stole the great cow of heaven, continued Professor Van Spee, and drew off a sufficient quantity of her milk into a standard opaque Mortensen chamber. Having skimmed the milk the usual way, I added cornflour, eggs, and a small quantity of the material commonly known, I believe, as Van Spee's crystals. Precisely the same material, I may add, as a sample you have in a twist of paper in your top pocket. I then subjected the resultant compound to intense bombardment with Z6 radiation, I believe you would call it a chemical fire. Also, it is not, properly speaking, fire in the sense that you would use the term, until it was completely denatured. Whereupon I froze it in the medium of transubstantiated gold alloyed with mercury and a pinch of baking soda. The result was a glutinous yellow semi-liquid with a slightly sweet taste, bearing a striking resemblance to ordinary confectioner's custard. When subjected to all the standard tests, however, the substance satisfied all the criteria of a new element. It also, as I subsequently discovered, had some remarkable and unexpected properties. Although an element in itself, it could both permeate and penetrate the other four, and in doing so inevitably it moulded itself to the shape of any given object, so as in effect to create an apparently identical copy of it, existing in parallel to it both in time and space. I will say that again, in case you have failed to appreciate its significance, when brought into contact with any inanimate object made up of earth, air, fire or water, a quantity of the element will form itself into an exact but detached replica. I was not able to find a way to duplicate living matter. Organic matter, once dead, could be replicated as easily as stone or plastic, but nothing alive. To date, in all the projects I have attempted, this has been my only failure. I regret it bitterly, but then nobody is perfect and I still have time. Initially, I was held back by the problem of access. Although I could prove beyond any question the existence of my replicas, I couldn't actually get to them, nor could I see, touch, hear, taste or smell them. I was forced to conclude, therefore, they existed in a separate and dedicated dimension. They had, in effect, slid through the object they were copying and out of the other side into what I could only describe as somewhere else. <laughs> This problem naturally reduced the usefulness of my creation somewhat, since all I could do with it was to enjoy the intellectual satisfaction of knowing it was there. My solution, elegant in its simplicity, was the artifact you know as the Acme Portable Door. A surprisingly basic mechanism, it allows travel backwards and forwards through time and space at will, including access to my synthetic universe. However, I soon realised that, although an efficient solution, it carried with it certain highly undesirable possibilities. In essence, it meant that I was no longer supreme ruler and sole inhabitant of my creation. Anybody coming into possession of a portable door could enter or leave my universe without difficulty. Naturally, that was unacceptable. Accordingly, I recalled and destroyed ten of the dozen doors that I had constructed. One I retained for my own use, one regrettably went missing, and I have only recently discovered what became of it. Suffice to say, it should no longer pose a threat. It was in the possession of Mr. Tanner's mother when I sealed up the closed file store just now. In my search for a substitute for the door, I now at any rate had a lead that was previously not available to me. Using the one remaining door, I could, in effect, conduct my search on both sides of the interdimensional barrier. Uh, sure enough, it was on the other side, in the synthetic universe, that I found the answer. Quite simply, Van Speed crystals will, if taken internally, pull you back from the synthetic universe to the natural one. Once you have made that transition, ingestion of crystals will enable you to cross between the dimensions at will, provided that your first crystal facilitated crossing is from synthetic to natural. In other words, the process is as simple as blinking. 
It was then a simple matter of travelling to the synthetic universe through the door and coming back by means of the crystals. Once I had done that, I was able to lock the door away in a vault in the bank of the dead, whence it could never be removed without my express permission, and use crystals exclusively in order to commute between universes. Now there, Paul thought, is a coincidence, or maybe just logic. After all, the only sane thing to do with something as massively dangerous as a portable door would be to stick it somewhere nobody could ever get at it. Hardly rocket science, so maybe it wasn't such a big deal that he'd have the same thought as the professor. It also meant, of course, that killing the professor extremely dead, a not unattractive idea if it turned out to be actually feasible, wouldn't really achieve a great deal, since he could use his door to escape, just as Paul had. Bummer! I have been telling you all of this, the professor continued, as if you were a fellow scientist, someone who understands the trials and frustrations of the academic life. I doubt whether that is the case. You simply don't know. In order to carry out research, one must have equipment, facilities, time, in other words, money, in theory, that is what governments are for, to provide support for learning and achievement, because what other possible justification could there be for them? <laughs> in practice, of course, one must find one's funding where one can. Throughout my researches, I finance my work, as all scientists must, if they lack sufficient private means. I invented things, spin-offs from my real work, and I sold them. Fatuous trifles, all of them. You can judge for yourself from the fact that my most lucrative single invention, for which I am best known in the world at large, is a portable car parking space, which you can fold up and put in your pocket when not in use. It is, of course, merely a little piece of my synthetic universe, twelve by seven feet of my personal space, endlessly duplicated and sold over and over again. A tragic prostitution of my work, but necessary nonetheless. It has paid for most of my greatest achievements. That is, of course, the way of things. Nobody will pay you money for defining the universe, and the patentee of the Black and Decker workmate gets more in a year in royalties than the combined lifetime earnings of Newton and Archimedes. When I first invented it, needless to say, there was no call for it. No cars, no tarmac roads, in fact, hardly any cities. But I foresaw that one day there would be a demand, particularly if I took steps to create one. <laughs> it's ironic, don't you think, that I laid all the foundations for the invention of the internal combustion engine, indeed the whole industrial revolution itself, simply in order to create urban gridlock, a shortage of car parking spaces and a lucrative demand for what I had to sell. Transmitting the profits back in time through a series of offshore, off-world and off-dimension intermediaries was a simple enough matter, a diversion for a rainy afternoon. As always, I was in control. I knew what I was doing. But the scope of the Synthetic Universe project meant that I had to keep on inventing, making money. Accordingly, I resigned my academic post and joined this firm of money grubbers. Here I could pursue my research in quiet and peace, interrupted only by the undemanding requirement of my partners that I should make them unimaginably rich. This I have done. <laughs> Trifling jobs of work were assigned to me, and I dealt with them. One such insignificant little job led to all this trouble, and certain's everything I have worked for, everything I have achieved and become. That is perhaps the greatest tragedy, and the greatest irony of all. It was, on the face of it, an entirely undemanding commission. About 30 years ago, a Canadian banking cartel, unhappy with changes in the corporate taxation system, decided to do something about it. They looked into the feasibility of overthrowing the government by armed force, but concluded that it wouldn't be cost-efficient. Then they consulted me. It had occurred to them that if, in 1776, the Canadian colonies had joined in the Revolutionary War, they would now be trading under American law and paying American taxes, which would save them a significant amount of money. Could I, therefore, adjust history accordingly? 
Having considered the matter, I told them that such a rearrangement was entirely feasible, but they had made several grave errors in their calculations, and that if I did as they asked, it would turn out to have been unable to compete with the US banking sector in the 1950s and been forced out of business by 1962. They were understandably rather disappointed and asked me, as of course they should have done in the beginning, if I could recommend a better course of action. I did some simple arithmetic and explained to them that if Canada had been successfully settled by Europeans in the early Middle Ages, a sufficiently powerful Canadian banking industry would have been in place by, say, 1917 to enable them to see off any threat from the US banks in the second half of the century and go on to establish a highly lucrative monopoly of the entire American continent by 1999. They were delighted by this prospect, as you can imagine, and instructed me to proceed without delay. A rather fatuous enjoinder, given the circumstances, but that's businessmen for you. It was easy enough to pinpoint the decisive moment in history at which the face of the earliest European settlement in Canada failed. As you may know, Vikings from Norway and Iceland under the leadership of Leif Eriksson established a small colony on the coast of Labrador around the year 81,000. History attributes their failure partly to harsh weather, crop failure and the hostility of the indigenous Amerindian population, but mostly to the sheer extent of their lines of communication and supply. They were quite simply too far from home to be supported, given the technological and cultural status of Viking Scandinavia. In order for the colony to have succeeded, therefore, I had to advance the civilization of 10th century Norway and Iceland by several centuries, so it would be capable of maintaining a colony across 3,000 miles of open sea. Once I had established that was the prerequisite, I was able to search for and locate my hinge, my turning point, and in due course I found it. The precise moment when the world changed was 17th of August AD 722, on the small island off the coast of Norway's Ranrika province. There, two petty chieftains fought a duel to decide which of them would rule South Central Norway. In the event, King Hring of Rogoland defeated and killed King Hrol of Westwald. You have no idea what Rogoland and Westwald are, but makes no difference whatsoever, and the consequences ensuing from that history are what we know as history. Had King Hro been the winner, however, things would have been quite different. Hro, a visionary and social reformer, would have gone on to weld the hold of Scandinavia into a single monolithic nation, dominant in Europe for the next five centuries. The heirs of King Hro would have possessed both the resources and the will to make a success of the Norse discovery of the new world. By the beginning of the 13th century, Canada would have seized its independence. By the 14th, it would have grown to be the second most powerful Western nation after France. There would have followed the usual round of religious and social conflicts, culminating in a bitter civil war somewhere around 1972, during which my client's bank would have sided with the winning faction, thereby ensuring their financial supremacy in the new world until the sun eventually goes cold and the planet ceases to be habitable. Beyond that, I did not care to speculate, since the extinction of all sentient life on the planet introduces variables into the calculations that I cannot reliably extrapolate from. All I had to do, therefore, was to ensure that Roar, not Ring, came back alive from the Chul on Bursa Island in the early evening of 17th of August 722. I need not overtax your limited concentration span with technical details. It was a fairly simple matter to go back in time using the portable door and engineer a chance meeting with the two combatants en route to the island. Very occasionally I enjoy disguises, dressing up, a little amateur acting. I played the part of an old peasant hedge wizard living in a miserable hovel on the shores of the fjord. By the simple expedient of permitting King Shaw to save me from drowning, it did not occur to him that it was extremely unlikely that a 70-year-old man who'd lived beside the water all his life would be unable to swim. Shaw had many selling qualities, but intelligence was not one of them. I was able to gain his unquestioning trust. He was basically a good-hearted man, stupid, egotistical and emotionally immature, but highly appreciative of what he believed was the sincere gratitude of a simple old man saved from a watery grave. 
Accordingly, when I offered him a gift of enormous value as a token of thanks, he accepted it without question. A wiser, more cynical man might have been suspicious, particularly since the gift was a sword. Only a fool would undertake to use a sword that he'd never handled before in a crucial and politically significant duel. A weapon given to him by a perfect stranger under circumstances of extreme melodrama. Fortunately for me and him, Ro was just such a fool. Since the sword I gave him was Skofnung, the most powerful of all the nine living blades forged by Wayland himself. A weapon that effectively guaranteed victory to anyone who wielded it. I had already been to some trouble to locate and acquire Skofnung. I eventually tracked it down in the vaults of the Peterson collection in Otslo. That, however, was the easy part. Considerably more difficult was the task of locating the young woman who constitutes the sorts of the half, without whom Skoftung is simply three feet of laminated steel. How I found her and how I induced her to assist me is another matter entirely, and some things that I would prefer not to go into at this time. My plan then was running smoothly. Once I had seen King Cross safely aboard the boat, I made my own way to Bursa Island to watch the contest. I did so only out of curiosity, as I had no doubt whatsoever concerning the outcome. My researches had revealed that, for the duel, Shaw's opponent, King Kring, had chosen the axe battle troll, a fine weapon of the very highest quality, and one with which he was most proficient. But it was no match whatsoever for a living blade. However, I had never actually seen a Viking duel, and my scientific interest was piqued. Rendering myself invisible by means of a simple Sobleski's glamour, I made myself comfortable and waited for the fight to begin. It was only when King Ring unloaded his equipment from the boat that I realised something that was badly wrong. The goatskin sack was the wrong shape for an axe. Somehow, he had acquired a sword instead. Nor was it just any sword. As soon as the cover was removed, I recognised it as Turfing, another of Wayland's living blades. As the fight began, I knew intuitively that I was not the only one seeking to meddle with history that day. Furthermore, I realised as Turfing parried Skofnung with an ear-splitting peal of harmonics, the substitution of Turfing for the axe could only represent a counter to my own act of interference. Someone had figured out what I had done, and was seeking to redress the balance. Furthermore, whoever it was lacked my knowledge and insight to a disastrous degree. It is a property of the living blade that it never gives up. Once it has begun a fight, it must inevitably finish it and achieve victory, even if it means that the fight lasts a thousand years. However, the two swords, Skofnung and Turfing, were exactly matched. Neither could overcome the other. In consequence, neither Hro or Hring could possibly win the fight. They would be condemned to fight it out for all time, their lives indefinitely extended, while the entire history of Canada, the New World, and therefore, by implication, all humanity would be suspended on hold, to use the modern expression, until the chill was over. In other words, thanks to the incompetent bungling of some wretched meddler, I had unwittingly brought about a temporal paradox of the greatest possible magnitude. I was appalled. I simply could not understand how such a thing could have happened, for the simple reason that nobody except myself could possibly have known what I had been intending to do. Naturally, I had taken the very greatest precautions to ensure security, both at the time and retrospectively. In fact, there was only one possible explanation, and although it was so hopelessly improbable that the very thought revolted me, I had no alternative but to accept it, since nobody but myself could possibly have known that King Hro would be wielding Skofnung that day. Nobody but myself could have arranged for King Hring to wield Turfring. The criminally incompetent bungler could only be me. Uh, uh, um, said Paul. The professor looked at him. By, um, Mr. Carpenter, he said, you mean to imply that it would surely have been impossible for me to have made such a mistake, knowing, as I quite obviously did, that arming King Ring with Turfing would not rectify my interference, but would in fact turn it into an insoluble disaster? Actually, that wasn't what Paul had meant at all. What he'd been trying to express, but they didn't make words big enough, was a suitable combination of I don't understand a word of this and the other one's got bells on. He couldn't be bothered to explain, though. 
You are, the professor went on, essentially correct. I couldn't have made such a crass error, not unless I had at some point in the interim forgotten what I'd done originally, or unless I had some reason, albeit hopelessly bizarre and far-fetched, for wanting to create a catastrophic temporal anomaly. Neither explanation, however, applies. This is the 21st century. If I'd have forgotten something back in the 8th century, I would by now have remembered forgetting it. As to the other hypotheses, all that needs to be said in that regard is that there are penalties for making disgusting messes in time, and those penalties are rigorously, even sadistically enforced by an individual of who even I am afraid. But... I'm getting, the professor said, ahead of my story. <laughs> At the point when you interrupted me, I was watching the opening stages of the jewel, standing open-mouthed with horror at the scenario unfolding before me. I knew that immediate action was called for. I had no viable options to pursue at that time. My only hope lay in prevarication, delay and obfuscation. <laughs> also, I panicked. The jewel could not, I decided, be allowed to continue. Accordingly, I caught hold of the nearest combatant to me. By chance, it happened to be King Kring, and dragged him with me through the portable door, away from the 8th century and into the 20th. Even as I did it, I knew that unless I was extremely careful, this initiative could only make things worse. Both living blades, Scoffnong and Turfing, had been unlawfully cheated out of their victory. Accordingly... Neither sword would rest until the duel was resumed. Once that happened, the duel could never end, since neither sword could beat the other, until the duel was resolved. Not only that, resolved in the 8th century, the history of Canada would be in a state of flux, with both alternative versions existing simultaneously in real time and real space. The implications of these things were clearly both infinite in number and monumental in scope. Only one of them, however, commanded my immediate attention at that point. By causing the anomaly I had, as I mentioned just now, broken the most basic loss of my craft, and thereby made myself liable to a most unattractive series of punishments at the hands of the only entity in all time and space that I have reason to be afraid of. Clearly then, my first priority was my own safety. I had to run, and then I had to hide. But where? It was at this juncture that the mystery that had puzzled me for some time suddenly became clear. Just now I glossed over, in a rather facile manner, my motives for creating my synthetic universe. I suggested to you that it was mere idleness and intellectual curiosity, that it was, in essence, a good idea at the time. I had been asking myself that question for several centuries. Because idleness and intellectual curiosity, why, they were by no means a sufficient reason for undertaking such a monumental task. And accordingly, I was entirely unconvinced. And now, quite suddenly, I knew the answer. I had built my synthetic universe as a place of refuge in anticipation of this very crisis. Somehow I had known, retrospectively, I can only assume, that one day I would need a place where nobody, not even my deadly enemy, could reach me. <laughs> I couldn't help but take a certain degree of pride in the foresight that I would one day have already exhibited. It would have been helpful, I admit, if at the same time I could have transmitted to myself a warning or some simple instructions, but I realised that it would have been extremely hazardous to do so, and that I would have been and would in the future be entirely justified in having complete confidence in my own ability to figure out the chain of causalities, if need be, from first principles. That I have not yet done so is no reflection on my intellectual abilities. All I need is a little more time, and perhaps one or two clues, which I am certain I have left for myself, secreted in some safe place where I will be sure to find them. Uh, um, said Paul again. This time the professor raised his eyebrows. Excuse me, he said. Uh, I'm sorry, Paul said, but I still haven't got the faintest idea what all that's got to do with me, or why I'm here, or why I just saw myself beating twelve kinds of shit out of Ricky Wormtoter with a bloody great sword. Was I not paying attention, or haven't we got to that bit yet? And also, he added, as the professor opened his mouth to answer, is there really a great cow of heaven, or was that bit just, you know, symbolic and stuff? Because if it turns out that the universe, the real one I mean, is really made out of yoghurt, I think I'd rather go and join Mr Dow's bridge club right now and screw the lot of you. 
The professor gave a long, sad sigh, plenty of his gypsy violins and rich with sincerity. That, he said, is probably just as well. Strange as it may seem, Mr. Carpenter, in one respect I envy you. There is one place where you have been and I have not. You have seen what lies beyond death. Of course I know all there is to know about it, but only second hand. From report and rumour, carefully scrutinised and analysed, using the finest protocols of scientific scholarship. You, by contrast, were little more than a tourist, but you have been there and seen it, and that is a different matter entirely. And very soon, he added, with an almost wistful expression, you will be there again, except that this time you will not be coming back. To answer your question, there is indeed a great cow of heaven. She most closely resembles a jersey, Charolais cross, but with a faint suggestion of Hereford around the jawline and upper shoulders. And yes, I suppose that in a sense the universe is in its most basic form made up of the... Not yogurt, precisely, but dairy products of a sort. You should not, incidentally, place too much confidence in Mr. Dow when he leads two no trumps or one club. Frequently he bluffs with unfortunate consequences for his partner. If you are ready, we may as well proceed with your termination. Too many long words can make your head spin. It took Paul maybe as long as half a second to translate termination into his kind of English, by which time the professor had pulled a pin out of the lapel of his cord and was just about to stick it into Paul's arm. With a yelp like an ironed dog, Paul jumped back, or tried to, nor ice. His feet stayed where they were, as though they'd been set in concrete by a very discreet gangster. The professor frowned. It was the sort of frown Paul had come across when he was a kid, and terrified of injections. This won't hurt, the professor's expression was telling him. Don't be such a cry, baby. It's for your all. Good. You'll like it once you get there. Just a fucking minute, he heard himself whimper. What harm did I ever do to you? I could, of course, explain, the professor replied. But what would be the point? Please keep still. I have a great many things to do once I've finished with you. And a little cooperation would be most welcome. Nothing you can do could possibly alter the outcome. And it's churlish to cause inconvenience for others, simply for the sake of being difficult. The pin! How many angels could dance on the head of it? And would any of them survive if they tried? Paul tried wriggling out of the way, but his arms and legs didn't seem to be working. Just a pin! What possible harm could it do? The Chinese have used them for acupuncture for thousands of years. Above all, it probably wouldn't hurt. Would it? And did he really want to waste any more time in a universe where there could possibly be such a thing as a great cow of heaven? Seen from that angle, Mr. Dow and his evening classes seemed positively inviting. Of course, he'd missed Sophie quite a lot. The professor jabbed at Paul with the pin. He swerved, a touch of flamenco dancing, rather more of the unexpected beetle down the back of the neck, and the point missed him by fractions of a millimetre. The professor tutted as though he'd caught him passing noughts in class. Would he be required to do a hundred lines before he was killed? What? <coughs> One last thing, he gasped. Breath was being rationed, apparently. What, what, what exactly is it with that needle thing? Is it poisoned or what? Does it really matter? The professor said wearily, You may safely assume that it is sufficient for the job in hand. Oh, oh, come on, Paul said. Don't be such a misery. Besides, I think I've got a right to know, especially if it's poison. I might be allergic or, or something. Maybe. It was simply the sheer reverse swing of the logic in that last statement. In any case, the professor hesitated and frowned. Quite possibly, after all those years associating with the finest intellects in history, he simply couldn't cope with a mind like Paul's. Since you insist, he said, it is not poison. Oh, if you'd be so kind as to stop wriggling. In a second, Paul said firmly. So, if it's not poison, what is it? The professor was starting to look downright grumpy. Magic, he replied. Really, Mr. Carpenter, I must insist. Magic? That's right. I thought you said that you're a scientist. Just the tiniest patch of raw nerve, apparently. I believe I have established my credentials quite adequately, Mr. Carpenter. Now, unless you stop prevaricating on this blatant manner, I shall have no option but to state you. How? I beg your pardon. How do you reckon? Paul said. And it took a lot of his remaining stamina. On, on doing that injection... 
<laughs> no offence, but you don't strike me as all that hot when it comes to needlework. <laughs> the professor paused, his brow furrowed. I shall cause the entire area to be flooded with anaesthetic gas, he said, as that would be a perfectly simple operation. Quite, Paul said. Fine, by all means, go ahead. Ting! went the falling penny. If the professor filled this place with gas, he'd zonk himself out too. Alternatively, he said, I can conjure a rope to tie you up with. Bet you can't. For heaven's sake, Mr. Carpenter, I can adjust the trajectory of a comet to within a sixteenth of a minute of an angle. Conjuring ropes ought to be child's play. Fine. Except I don't think you can. Otherwise, you'd have done it already. I think you're too... Uh, what's the word I'm after? You're too highly specialised. It's like hiring a brain surgeon to pull a tooth. Admit it. You're screwed. Certainly not. All I have to do, said the professor, as so persuading himself, is wait until you fall asleep, as you inevitably must. However, since it would prolong the traumatic experience of waiting for the inevitable, I would prefer to dispense with all futile attempts at resistance. Paul dredged up a grin from somewhere. It was a bit soft around the edges, and it had that forced air you get in old four-doors, where the sitters have had to keep exactly still for ten minutes, but it was the best he could do. Nah, he said. You'd fall asleep first. I most certainly would not. Say it's you, Paul sniggered. It's it's what's his name? It's subliminal suggestion. The moment I started talking about you falling asleep, your eyelids suddenly started getting heavy. <laughs> Any second now, you'll be zizzing away like a buzzsaw. You want to be careful. You don't stick yourself with your own pin while you're at it. Or are you immune to, uh, <laughs> magic? He partnered the last word with a sort of ultra-snide sneer with lots of top lip in it. The professor shook his head again, but this time there was rather more energy in the gesture. You are playing for time by seeking to engage me in fatuous arguments and discussions, hoping that something will intervene and distract or incapacitate me. Such a strategy is doomed to failure. Your left shoelace is undone, and your television license expires today. Let me put you out of our mutual misery, Mr. Carpenter. Both of us will feel better for it. There was an urgency in the professor's voice that Paul hadn't ever heard before. Also a very reluctant admission of uncertainty, just as if God had paused in the middle of handing down the Ten Commandments to ask if Moses had the right time. He needs my permission, Paul suddenly realised, in a flash of intuition that didn't come from anywhere inside him. He needs my permission before he can kill me. Get stuffed he said, forcing his eyelids apart. Look, you may be a partner in the firm, and the cleverest man who ever lived and practically immortal, and who gives a shit and what else, but you can't hurt me. Not here, he hazarded, trying to sound as though he had the faintest idea what he was talking about. Anywhere else, but not here. Not unless I give in. Isn't that right? No, the professor snapped. He was a pathetic liar. Yes, Paul corrected him. It's because there's no such thing as death here, isn't it? That's how you're nearly immortal here, and and why I couldn't bash your face nearly when I tried. There's no such thing as death or getting hurt here. Not unless, he hesitated. Sophie had given him the most terrific smack around the face earlier. He'd been convinced she'd cracked his jaw, because it had hurt so much. But a few minutes later, it was perfectly all right again, and he hadn't given it Mormon's thought since. All right. When Sophie had thumped him, he'd believed. Therefore, his mind had provided him with the pain he'd expected to feel. Then he'd got sidetracked. The purported busted jaw had slipped his mind. And now it is completely better. And if that wasn't good enough, what about Ricky and the psychotic athlete with the uncanny resemblance to P. Carpenter? Lots of hacking and slashing with big scary swords, completely one-sided fight, but not a drop of blood anywhere. Maybe Ricky didn't know the rules, which was why he'd been fighting back instead of just standing there sticking his tongue out while the blood-crazed loon carved him like a virtual Christmas turkey. Nevertheless... Uh, not unless, Paul repeated, you're dumb enough to believe that you can be hurt. Like, say, if I was to give up and hold still so you could jab me with that stupid pin thing, if I really thought it could kill me, it would, but I know better, so it can't, right? The professor smiled. At least a thin crack opened up between his nose and his chin. Would you care to put that hypothesis to empirical proof, Mr. Carpenter? If so, sure, Paul said, and suddenly he could move his arms and legs quite freely. He held out his hand palm upwards. Go ahead, he said. But it won't do you any good, because I don't believe in fairies any more. Well, I'm waiting. Such a look of sheer cold hatred he'd never seen before. It glowed through the professor's eyes like candlelight through a Halloween pumpkin. 
How annoying, the professor said. How vexing that you should choose this moment to discover your latent intelligence. A few weeks earlier, and you could have had been of such great use to me as my assistant in my work, that you should pick this time to evolve is most... He shook his head sadly. Most unfair, he said. In case you're interested, this is the first major setback I've encountered in over 325 years. Whoopee! Paul said grimly. Do I get a prize? Or a badge or something? Hardly. The professor took a step back. Nothing so agreeable. I shall leave you now and take a trip through the portable door to 16th of November 1980. Disguised, he added with a very mild smirk, as a Jehovah's Witness of unparalleled eloquence and persistence. I regret having to do it, of course. Such a blunt and brutal approach is practically an admission of defeat. However, I have to say, you have nobody to blame but yourself. Goodbye, Mr. Carpenter. It was hardly a pleasure having known you, but not certainly an education. He was backing away through the wall, as if he was a ghost or the wall wasn't really there. As Paul watched him go, he was counting frantically on his mental fingers, just to check that he'd guessed right. November, December, January, February. Quite right, the professor told him as his ears vanished into the plaster. Eight months and twenty-six days before you were born. On the night in the question, your mother wasn't really in the mood. Your father had been drinking a little. The arrival of a Jehovah's Witness who refuses to be shooed away. Suddenly the professor broke off. He was staring at Paul, his mouth slightly open. Good heavens, he said. Remarkable, quite remarkable. In that case, he pulled himself together with a visible effort. In that case, I shall not doubt see you again soon enough, at which point we can resolve all of the issues between us. I, I hope so. I, I, Just the tip of his nose was sticking out of the wall now, and a few wisps of eyebrow. I just don't know any more. As soon as he'd definitely gone, Paul sagged like share prices in an oil crisis to a thought of Professor Van Spee on his own turf. Brave. Definitely brave. Brave, he couldn't help thinking, as two short planks. He didn't know the professor all that well, but you don't have to be a on best buddy lawnmower borrowing terms with someone to get the impression that they don't give up quite so easily. Apparently the threat to see to it that Paul would never be conceived, a Jehovah's Witness, he thought, that's just so diabolical, it wasn't going to be carried out. It was almost as though Fan Spee had fast rewound that moment in his mind and found there something he really hadn't been expecting. That set up a whole gallery of images in Paul's mind, none of which he wanted any part of. He shook himself like a wet dog. Time, he really felt, he wasn't here. Talking of which, before Van Spee had bubbled up out of nowhere and started prattling about living blades and great cows of heaven, he'd been about to try and do something. What was it? Ah, yes, Ricky Worm taught her. He tried to remember. Was he going to kill him, or just place him under citizen's arrest? Well... Looked like killing him was a long starter anyway. Here, where death didn't work unless you wanted it to, or the whole audience clapped or something. So that just left. Paul remembered. He pictured Mr Tanner's mum charging into the room, and then the room ceasing to exist, with her and Ricky and whoever that was with the fierce and the sword all trapped inside. He remembered the stunned blank feeling when he'd been sure they were all suddenly dead, or at the very least never coming back. He remembered feeling angry enough to want to smash in the teeth of a partner in J.W.W. and former Professor Emeritus in the University of Leiden. Odd that he should have forgotten that. It had seemed so very important before he got chatting and let the Professor distract him with great cows and opt-in death threats. Think, Paul urged himself, like a horse led to water. No harm can come to anybody here, but it looks like he sent them somewhere else. But where else was there? Real space, dodgy old place, but not necessarily fatal. Custard space, which was here. There wasn't anywhere else. Was there? Anyway, to answer the question, that just left rescue. Because Paul reasoned with a strong why the fuck me feeling going on right down into the marrow of his bones, if Van Spee wanted rid of them, he pretty much had to get them back or else he'd be screwed. Why this was inevitably so, he wasn't quite sure. He just knew. That was all. Deep breath. Then he tried very hard to picture in his mind the doorway that Van Spee had caused to disappear. 
Somehow he was convinced that it was still there, somehow. If only he could get a grip on it, a fingernail under the very edge so he could prise off the lid. How nice it would be, he thought, if right now I had the gift of being able to do magic. I could perform a really neat revealing spell, or a dead cool opening charm, or maybe crackly green fire would leap from my fingertips and blast a bloody great big hole in the wall. Or maybe a kindly old voice would whisper in my mind's ear, Use the force, Luke, and I'll be just able to do it, like wiggling my ears. But I can't. Staring at the wall wasn't doing any good, so Paul sat down with his back to it instead, because in all those movies that was how the hero accidentally found the hidden lever that opened the secret passage. But that was just another kind of magic that didn't work. Maybe they really were gone forever. Quite possibly they were, but he wasn't giving up, mostly because he was stuck here with nothing else he particularly wanted to do, so he might as well persevere as get out a pen and start playing noughts and crosses with himself on the plaster work. But there was nothing he could do. Right? Wrong. Paul felt in his top pocket, just to make sure it was still there, and it was. There was something he could do, something magical and J.W.W.-ish, which was a very good, except it was the wrong thing. He could still do it, of course. It wouldn't help. Quite probably make everything a whole lot worse, but yes, he could do it. He considered that for a moment, bloody stupid idea, but on the other hand, it's the way this country's been governed for the last 50 years, he took out the little paper packet containing Van Spee's crystals, pulled it open and spilled its contents into the palm of his hand. He could eat these, he thought. They were supposed to make him able to travel back to real space from here. But what if he scoffed them while leaning on the bit of wall where a door used to be? One that used to open is the closed file store, but which now apparently led to somewhere quite other. Indigestion, probably. Or he'd end up back in the genuine 70 St Mary Axe, where he'd be arrested by Mr Tanner's goblins for killing Ricky Wormtorta, who wasn't going to be able to stand up and admit he wasn't dead, really, because now he possibly was. <laughs> Paul thought. Too bloody complicated for me. He closed his eyes, opened his mouth and gulped. For a moment, absolutely nothing. Then the wall began squidging out between his fingers, as though he were leaning on, see, custard. The great cow of heaven, he thought, for crying out loud. Then he fell over. Paul woke up and lifted his head off his hands. I said, growled a horribly familiar voice behind him, wake up. Every muscle in Paul's body stiffened and he swung around in his seat, in doing so barking his knee against the leg of the desk. Behind him stood Miss Hook, just the same as when he'd last seen her. Suddenly it seemed terribly important that he should remember exactly how long ago that was. Good question, actually. It was either eleven years or three minutes, but he wasn't quite sure. You were asleep, said Miss Hook, with that ominously soft tone of voice that always meant extreme danger. You were asleep and making funny noises, giggles all around him. Paul didn't dare break eye contact with Miss Hook, but he could dimly see rows of desks, faces behind them. You were dreaming, she went on. Rather an interesting dream by the sound of it, but she'd like to share it with the rest of the class.